of it. Good morning and welcome to the Tuesday Morning Bible Study on this June the 12th, or no, I'm sorry, 11th, June 11th of 2024. Uh, today we will be looking at two chapters, uh, chapters 27 and 28, um, and then I'm going to suggest, and I'll say more about this next week, but um, for my own reasons, we are going to, um, we're going to uh, work at a more accelerated pace uh, uh, after today for reasons that I'll I'll explain more about next week. Uh, Tom, okay. be, 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 uh, before we begin, yeah, uh, uh, we, we've been opening chapters with uh, the in the beginning of the reign of uh, of right. of uh, uh, of Jeb uh Jebekiah, no, 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 I'm sorry, Jehoiakim. Right. Son of Josiah. Now we begin in the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah. Right. Uh, right. They were brothers. Right. Right. Yeah, Zedekiah was the last, uh, was the, the last king of Judah. He was, he was the last king of Judah before, um, uh, before the Babylonians came in and destroyed everything. Okay, we 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 ended up last time with Jehoiakim bringing Uri Uriah back from Egypt and taking his head. Something like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so much for thou shalt not kill. Right, right, right. Indeed, indeed. Uh, I mean, how did how does uh, Jebekiah then become king? How does Zedekiah become king? I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How does Zedekiah? Yeah. 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 How, how do we go from one brother to the next? The uh, the previous brother. Oh gosh. Now I'm getting. Now I'm getting confused. The previous brother, I believe. Uh. Yeah. In five ninety seven. In five ninety seven, he was um, he was exiled to um, exiled to Babylon. Yeah. Remember, he was he was taken he was taken away by the Babylonians in 597 BC. He's the one who actually survives and gets a favorable, a relatively favorable treatment. Okay, so, at the hands of Jeremiah, uh, it's Zedekiah, right. the ones who stay and who were around, you know, for the Babylonians to come the second time. It's Zedekiah and his entourage that are going to come under such, you know, come under such condemnation. So, uh, yeah. All right. Chapter 27, verse one. We're going to read, um, we're going to read large swaths of this. Um, in fact, let's read the whole chapter and then we'll deal with the whole chapter. Um, there we go. In the beginning of the reign of King Zedekiah, son of Josiah of Judah. So this is this is uh, 597 BC following the first exile. This word came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Thus the Lord said to me, make yourself a yoke of straps and bars and put them on your neck. Send word to the king of Edom, the king of Moab, the king of the Ammonites, the king of Tyre, and the king of Sidon by the hand of the envoys who have come to Jerusalem to King Zedekiah of Judah. Give them this charge for their masters. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, this is what you shall say to your masters. It is I who by my great power and my outstretched arm have made the earth with the people and animals that are on the earth, and I give it to whomever I please. Now I have given all these lands into the hand of King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, my servant, and I have given him even the wild animals of the field to serve him. All the nations shall serve him and his son and his grandson until the time of his own land comes. Then many nations and great kings shall make him their slave. But if any nation or kingdom will not serve this king, Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, and put its neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon, then I will punish that nation with the sword, with famine, and with pestilence says the Lord, until I have completed its destruction by his hand. You therefore must not listen to your prophets, your diviners, your dreamers, 
your soothsayers or your sorcerers who are saying to you, you shall not serve the king of Babylon. For they are prophesying a lie to you with the result that you will be removed far from your land. I will drive you out and you will perish. But any nation that will bring its neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon and serve him, I will leave on its own land, says the Lord, to till it and live there. I spoke to King Zedekiah of Judah in the same way. Bring your necks under the yoke of the king of Babylon and serve him and his people and live. Why should you and your people die by the sword, by famine, and by pestilence, as the Lord has spoken concerning any nation that will not serve the king of Babylon? Do not listen to the words of the prophets who are telling you not to serve the king of Babylon, for they are prophesying a lie to you. I have not sent them, says the Lord, but they are prophesying falsely in my name, with the result that I will drive you out and you will perish and you and the prophets who are prophesying to you. Then I spoke to the priests and to all this people, saying, Thus says the Lord, Do not listen to the words of your prophets who are prophesying to you, The vessels of the Lord's house will soon be brought back from Babylon, for they are prophesying a lie to you. Do not listen to them. Serve the king of Babylon and live. Why should this city become a desolation? If indeed they are prophets, and if the word of the Lord is with them, then let them intercede with the Lord of hosts, that the vessels left in the house of the Lord, in the house of the king of Judah, and in Jerusalem, may not go to Babylon. For thus says the Lord of hosts concerning the pillars, the sea, the stands, and the rest of the vessels that are left in this city, which King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon did not take away when he took into exile from Jerusalem uh, to Babylon, King Jeconiah, son of Jehoiakim of Judah, and all the nobles of Judah and Jerusalem. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, concerning the vessels left in the house of the Lord, in the house of the king of Judah and in Jerusalem. They shall be carried to Babylon, and there they shall stay until the day when I give attention to them, says the Lord. Then I will bring them up and restore them to this place. All right. There's a basic theme running through, you know, it's, it's two slightly different subjects, but it, it's this, a common theme that's running through. So your translation doesn't say, I will bring them back? Uh, it says, I will bring them up and restore them to this place. Yeah, my, my, mine is uh, bring them back. Why bring them up is odd. Um, it probably refers to the fact that in order to get back that if you're in Babylon, but you're going back to Judah, that you actually have to go north before you go, before you go west, or or go north before you go south. Uh, you follow the you follow the follow the, the river the follow the river follow the fertile crescent up and then and then down. Yeah. Otherwise, because otherwise you're walking through desert. You know. So. Um. <clears throat> So, so what's the uh, what's the the common theme here? What's the what's the uh, the essence of this? You have to be subservient to Babylon. Yeah, know the time, <laughs> recognize the time for what it is, and uh, you know maybe maybe there was a time when none of this would have been necessary, and and you could have you could have if you had. You know, if you had followed the covenant, if you had done things right to begin with, this day might, this day probably would never have come. But as it is, you didn't, and it has. And so now you're going, you, it's like you've made your bed, now you have to sleep in it. Um, and to the extent that that's true, then for you, for people to, bristle against that what from jeremiah's point of view is the divine that divine judgment <clears throat> bristle against that at this point um is is actually disobedience to god um and ultimately as we will you know as we will see you don't see it so much in this passage but uh, as we will see eventually zedekiah is going to be provoking unrest he's going to be provoking a rebellion a very very misguided rebellion but a rebellion 
against uh, against the Babylonians, which is then going to prompt Nebuchadnezzar to come back. And from Nebuchadnezzar's point of view, finish what he started. Uh, and that's when that's when Jerusalem is, you know, more or less flattened. Uh, and the and the rest of those who are ultimately headed to exile go into exile. Um, Zedekiah and his sons are themselves taken taken captive. And Zedekiah, uh, again, it's not in this passage, obviously, but Zedekiah's sons are executed in his presence. And then Zedekiah himself is blinded. Blinded. So, yeah. He, he's, I mean, he's not even done the dignity of 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 being being executed, of being killed. He uh, he's blinded. And he lives with that, um, and then that and that is with that is the end of the of the royal the royal line, um, or at least the end of the um, the end of royal rule of 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 the Davidic of Davidic rule anyway. Um, <clears throat> Tom, yeah. Would you talk about um it talks about the yoke of the king of Babylon. You have to put on the yoke and serve the king of Babylon. But yeah. up in um verse two, mm -hmm. when the Lord speaks to um Jeremiah, mm -hmm. take the cords and bars of a yoke and put them on your neck. That's right. not the yoke of the king of Babylon. No, but it is a it is an it is a literal yoke. That is a prophetic demonstration of the spiritual truth, the practical truth that Jeremiah is going to be uh, uh, delivering as a message. Um, this is a this is a, a, a good example of of something that you see in in a fair bit of Old Testament prophetic literature where, God commands the prophet to do something that is very unusual, uh, that is meant to be a kind of object lesson for the larger message that the prophet is to proclaim. Um, for example, um, Hosea. <laughs> That's probably like the paradigmatic example is the prophet Hosea, who is uh, commanded to take, uh, you know, take a prostitute as his wife. And her name is, you know, is some bizarre name like, uh, like, uh, I, I reject my people. I, I don't have a specific, I don't, I can't come up with the exact name, but you know, some, some bizarre name, uh, and, and the idea is that he does it. He does it literally. But the reason he's commanded to do it is that it is a like a living demonstration of a message that Hosea then delivers to the people. So if the prostitute's name, if the prostitute's name is I reject my people, Hosea does it, and then he proclaims and then and then the message to the people is God is rejecting you, you, the people, and you have been acting like a prostitute, <laughs> you know, is, is kind of the idea. Um, and there, there, there are other examples. So even in Jeremiah, there are examples of where Jeremiah is commanded to, uh, you know, to eat something, uh, to eat something that's bitter because the message that he is about to proclaim is, bitter to you know to the people that kind of thing um that's what's going on here is that this yoke is a kind of object lesson it's uh it's not unlike um some churches do uh children's sermons and the um the principal means of delivering a children's sermon I mean, as one who has given many children's sermons in his life, the principal means of, uh, or the principal method of children's sermons are object lessons. Mm -hmm. You know, you you bring in something. Um, I mean, I'm just you you bring a blanket. I mean, this is this is dumb, and this, this, no no real 
pastor would ever give this as a children's sermon, but you'll get the idea. Pastor brings in a blanket, wraps it around, wraps it around himself. And then he says, the love of God is just <laughs> like this blanket. It keeps us warm. And, you know, something like that. You know, that you use an object, you use something as an analogy, as a as a metaphor for, you know, whatever it is that you're teaching. Uh, and um that is a, that's what's going on here, is that this is okay. this is an object lesson. And and we see the Old Testament prophets being commanded by God to engage in these kinds of things. Any connection at all to take this yoke upon you, which we hear in the Messiah? That's a great, that's a great, great question. Um, it's definitely, when when Jesus says that in the Gospel of Matthew, which, of course, uh, uh, Handel picked up in, the, in Messiah, um, it is the same, it is the same, object i mean it's the same instrument it's the sand it's the same idea it's the it's the idea that by putting on the yoke you are uh you are taking on um uh, you're taking on the work that the master is commanding it, um, it, 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 it's kind of like god's karma <laughs> okay okay but it's, <laughs> but it's but it is i mean it, but yeah. it's taking i mean it's acknowledging the lordship of god um well in this case in this case in this literal case it's acknowledging the lordship of at least the temporal lordship of nebuchadnezzar you know and that by taking on the yoke of the king of babylon means that you are now the servants of nebuchadnezzar uh, at least, at least for a while, at least for a time, a God ordained time. This is this is your lot. <laughs> this is your your God decreed lot that you will be the servants uh, of the of the King of Babylon for a for a set time. Uh, that is to take on the yoke. Uh, it, it means to, to be, you know, literal literally it means you're taking on uh, servitude. Uh, just as a, just as when you put a yoke on an ox, and then the ox does the work, or at least provides the the principal energy for you to plow your plow your your fields. Um, that ox is committed to your work, committed to your service, and at your direction. Um, and uh, so then when it comes to Jesus, Jesus is, is then using that image to say, um, you know, that, you know, that we're, while we're certainly children of God, we are also servants of God, mm -hmm. you know, that we are servants of God, that we are, we are not here to do just simply to do our own thing. We're here for a purpose. We're here to do God's work. Now, as it happens, <laughs> As we, as you read the rest of what Jesus says, as it happens, it is only in that servanthood to, you know, to God, under God, that we actually find our real purpose and our true freedom. Uh, in our servanthood under God, we find our freedom. We find that, as Jesus puts it, that in fact, the purpose of the yoke, the purpose of the servanthood is not bondage or oppression. It is actually life. And that as we walk that path, we discover that. We discover that this servanthood, that being a servant of God is actually the truest freedom. Uh, <clears throat> and, uh, and, so, and, and thus Jesus says, uh, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my burden is easy, and my or for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. It's light. Not that it doesn't. Not that it's easy. Not, not that it's easy in the sense that we think of easy, but easy and light in the sense that it's that it ultimately liberates us rather than oppressing us. 
uh, it all it is the only means by which we can truly live into our purpose, into the purpose for which we were created. Uh, and in that we experience the abundant life that Jesus speaks of elsewhere. Uh, that's a great, great, great question. No question but that when Jesus made that, said that, he is thinking of, of, of not only of the agricultural you know, practice putting a yoke on an oxen, but he is certainly aware of the many times that this image appears in the Old Testament, uh, Old Testament scriptures. Yeah, Tom, there's something else I'm not following. These uh -huh. references to Moab and Edom and right. Ammon and Ty, the, these were all previous lands of Israel. Uh, uh, no, uh, no, they were um, traditional enemies of Israel, actually, but they had one thing in common with Israel, and that is <laughs> they were equally, equally taken over by Babylon. Uh, right, right, right. But under David and Solomon, they were part of Israel. Uh, Tyre and Sidon. Tyre and Sidon. Yeah, I mean, they're under Solomon. Solomon. Uh, e e Edom, Edom, certainly. So under Solomon, there was, yeah, there was some incorporation, yeah. but, yeah. but, you know, following that, those, those nations broke off, you know, I mean, that, that was a short, that was a brief, a very brief uh, affair that didn't last long. Um, right. But so, so, so now, now God is saying, uh, t t tell them also. Yeah. To, to, yeah. To, to, it's, to, it's in there you know that it's interesting that they're even brought into brought that, into that's the, that's what i'm saying it's interesting yeah. because they they were part of the of, of of the greatness of david and solomon uh that's an interesting read of it i i i don't know i don't know if that's in i don't know if that's what's in mind or not right or I if that or if that is a or if that is a kind of proto universalism, uh, a kind of a kind of anticipation of the idea that the God that the God of Israel is in fact the God of the whole world. Uh, you know, we've we've well, spoken. It's, it, it's immediately followed by "I made the earth with yeah. my great strength." Right. That's oh, yeah. that's why I'm I'm I I lean that way. That's why I lean that way because it's precisely you know I've said I've said on a few occasions that it's precisely this experience of the exile that in Jewish reckoning in Jewish reflection on the experience it's precisely through that experience that Jews really did complete that move from uh, Hanatheism to monotheism, from the belief that our God, our God, or the God of Israel is the best God and the God that we're, that, that we are or should be committed to versus our God is the only God there is, the only God that actually exists and is in fact the God of the whole world, whether other nations acknowledge that truth or not that theological shift is brought to a kind of completion in the experience of exile but you but i think that even with the um you know with jeremiah you you pro, in the historical jeremiah i suspect you get anticipations of that. Um, you get anticipations of this view, of this larger view that that the purpose of God's dealings with Israel is ultimately that they that the Godship of God, the Lordship of God, recognized by Israel, ultimately becomes something that the whole world is to recognize. Right. It now extends to Babylon. He's he's responsible for Babylon. Yes, and that, that's a great point. That is a really great point because indeed the God who is the God of Israel is also, though unacknowledged, mm -hmm. not acknowledged by Babylon, not acknowledged by Nebuchadnezzar, is in fact the God of the Babylonians as well. Uh, 
Yeah. I mean, you you see that. I mean, it's really, it's like this shift is happening in real time. You you see the the hints of it. Um this you see the shift, the hints of it happening in real time. Uh, and it's it's really it's really quite a quite a wonder to see. Yeah, God God has become the unifying element now of all of these lands. Yeah. The the older lands of Israel together with Babylon and uh, this, this this huge unifying element uh, of a single God. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, and you know, and certainly by the time by the time we're well into the exile itself and the freedom from the exile, you know, and you get into so called Second Isaiah. Uh, second Isaiah, uh, which would be uh, chapters forty through fifty-five. I mean, just just for fun, sometime you know when you when you're when you're weary of reading Jeremiah, go and read chapters forty through fifty-five of Isaiah, and you will see just one reference after another to the false gods of the nations, the dumbness of idols, mm -hmm. and all of that, and and you'll see Yahweh being elevated beyond just being a god of a particular people to being indeed acknowledged or unacknowledged being the god of the whole world but that the destiny of the world is ultimately to acknowledge the the lordship of yahweh over all the world um yeah um the the final thing i want to point out here in this chapter is um is that along with the message that God is giving to Jeremiah to proclaim, there's a there's a, a positive aspect of it, and there's a negative aspect of it. It's like, listen to me when I say this, but also the people that tell you otherwise <laughs> are lying to you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not just listen to me because I'm right, but don't listen to them because they're wrong. They're wrong. They're lying to you. They are speak whether they know it or not, whether they are aware of it or not, they are speaking to you a lie that they are proclaiming as the word of the Lord. Uh, and, and what that message is presumably is Resist, resist the king of Babylon, fight the king of Babylon, uh, because we're righteous, we're right, Babylonians are evil, and uh, and therefore, you know, in the name of God, in the name of righteousness and holiness, fight the Babylonians. And while I'm sure Jeremiah can appreciate where that's coming from, in another age... In a different time, that might well have been a righteous message in another time. In this time, <laughs> in this time, with the role that the Babylonians are playing in God's economy, according to Jeremiah, the role that they're playing in God's economy, um, that what in another age might well be the righteous cause, the righteous thing, in fact, is the unrighteous cause. It's actually resisting the will of God. because, And it's resisting the will of God because it's resisting the great message. It's resisting the great message that the people are meant to hear, the lesson that they are meant to learn. In a way, it would be like, and this just occurred to me in the moment, it'd be like if you had a family member who had committed many crimes, you know, a family member who'd committed many crimes and was essentially unrepentant, okay? Guilty as, you know, guilty as anything, but unrepentant, Okay. And then the person gets apprehended and they get tried and they get thrown into prison. Okay. Um, and you could, 
if you're you're the family member who hadn't committed a crime, you could, in the name of family loyalty, say, well, I'm loyal to my family. I'm going to break this person out. You know, I'm going to break this person out. Uh, and there's a role for family loyalty. I mean, it was certainly there family loyalty in a vacuum is not a is not a bad thing. Um loving your family, loving, you know, lo loving your loving your relatives, loving your uh, honoring your father and your mother, all of that stuff is is important, uh, sort of as such. But in this circumstance, breaking your breaking your unrepentant family member from prison is not only an impractical idea, <laughs> it's not only an impractical idea, it does not ultimately serve the end of justice or repentance. It doesn't serve the end of justice or repentance. And so in that sense, that while God in broad strokes desires that all people be free, <laughs> that all people have life and have it more abundantly, there is a reason this person is in prison. <laughs> and while this person may not be meant to stay in prison forever and ever, there is a there is a period of time, a sentence, there is a period of time in which it is appropriate and God's will, so to speak, that this sentence be served, okay? And to resist that is to resist, is to resist the judgment of God. Well, kind of in the same way, the people have been sentenced to servitude under the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar uh, and not arbitrarily, you know, not just because God, God's, you know, uh, not, not feeling well, you know, it's because, because of repeated covenantal, covenantal violations and that this, this is, this is divine judgment, divine justice working itself out in real time and that the best thing that the people can do is accept this sentence make the best of it serve the time and then when the sentence is over when when the purpose for the Servit the servitude has played out, then to receive liberation at God's hand and, and as a divine gift. Um, but that in the meantime, you accept you accept it and you try to learn from <laughs> try, you have some time, you know, as it were, you you're serving your time. You have some time to think about what you have done, you know, mm -hmm. and and that's kind of what Jeremiah is urging upon the people is that, you know, you're going to have some time to think about what you have, what you have done and the meaning of these events. And now, now it's time to accept that and to, and you've made your bed, you got to sleep in it. Uh, it won't necessarily be forever, but you have to deal with it as it is now. And those people who say, no, we don't deserve this. No, we, you know, this isn't for us. We're meant to be free people. And so rise up in rebellion against Babylon. They're, they're leading, they would be leading the people down a path that is both theologically and practically wrong theologically and practically theologically because it resists the fact that god's judgment is what is behind these events practically resisting the babylonians right now is a really really bad idea 
<laughs> not really going to impractical <laughs> idea. What's that? What's not that? going to work. It is not going, not to, going work. to work. <laughs> it is just a bad idea, you know. And and Jeremiah, you know, I mean, Jeremiah says both. I mean, he says as much. You know, it's it's theologically a bad idea because it 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 ignores the fact that God's judgment is in play here, but but it is also, you know, what's uh, the stuff about um uh. Why, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, ver like for example, verse 13, it's re this idea is repeated, um, uh, where it says, uh, verse 12, it says, Bring your necks under the yoke of the king of Babylon and serve him and his people and live. Why should you and your people die by the sword, by famine and by pestilence? Yeah. You know, I mean, <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> it's wildly impractical for you to think that any kind of rebellion at this point is <clears throat> even even if it was a theologically good idea, which it's not. But even if it's a theologically good idea, you still got to think it's, this is not going to end well if you if you try it. Uh, and so uh, so Jeremiah is kind of making that appeal on both on both in both aspects. Uh, the same the same message of Jesus. Uh, uh, Pax, Pax Romana. And he was he 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 was not what the he was not the Messiah they were looking for. He, but yeah, uh, yeah uh, but what? I like to get the story straight. Mm -hmm. You you've done well with the message. Mm -hmm. But chapter 24 begins with uh the son of Jehoiakim. Mm -hmm. Okay. 25 begins with the fourth year of Jehoiakim. Right. 26 begins with the first year of Jehoiakim. We're going backwards. Right, right. Now, now 27, we're talking about Jehoiakim is now out of the picture, and we have another son of Josiah. Right. This is, this is, if I were assembling this, I would have done it in reverse order. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> can't argue with you. Very uh, confusing. No, I, yeah, I can't. I can't. I can't dispute that. I. It's uh, there is a there is a there is a, a large degree of what looks like disorganization. Uh, yes. Yeah, and I I don't really have a I really don't have a good explanation for why that is, um, other than my general comment I made up uh like two weeks ago about the balance of judgment and uh hope you know but even the even with that i mean i i, I mean i i i i uh, receive your point i receive your point that even with that understanding the balance between judgment and hope it still would have been nice if the organization had been a little more chronological you know yeah. uh but uh, yeah, I, and there I really don't have I really don't have an explanation for for why that is. Uh, all right, well, let's get to chapter twenty. Um, and for, wait, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, Linda. Just one question in uh, verse nineteen: the um, the things that are going to be carried off, pillars, the sea. My translation says trolleys. You read something different there, and all the other yeah. vessels left in the city. Yeah. Um, yeah. The uh, not verse nineteen. The pillars, the sea, the stands, and the rest of the vessels that are okay. After the after the sea, what do, what do you have after the sea? After the sea, um, the stands. Stands. Yeah. Let me let me read you real quick the note. Truly. Let me let me read you the note that is in my Bible here. Uh, okay. The stands were actually let me read the whole note because what I'm about to say about the stands won't make any sense without the, the first part. Um the the note on verses 18 through 22 here says the sacred object that this is referring to the sacred objects that remained after 597 BC that would ultimately be taken away. Uh, to Babylon with 587 BC. Um, there were two cast bronze freestanding pillars oh. at the entrance of the temple. Mm -hmm. 
a huge basin or tank standing perhaps some 10 feet in height. The sea was also cast bronze, perhaps located at the entrance to the temple and before the altar. It's estimate, it's like a like a huge, mm -hmm. you know, place for water. Its estimated capacity was approximately 12,000 gallons. Second Chronicles 4 6 indicates it was used as a basin in which the priests washed. The stands, the stands were ornamented bronze wagons upon which were mounted the ten lavers or wash basins. See 1 Kings 7, 27 through 39. Mm. Uh, in 587 BC, the pillars, basin, and the stands were broken into pieces, and these and other vessels in the temple were taken to Babylon. Good. Okay. Yeah. What What happened to the to the uh, you had the the, uh, the 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 images of the oxen. Uh, the the I'm sorry the, the there were the, cher the 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 cherubims cherubim and seraphim uh -huh. yeah uh the, the, these were these 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 castings in the in, in the inner room mm -hmm. uh uh there were there were two different sets uh one yeah. what, 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 one one was of 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 of, of sheep or, or lambs or uh, I, I, yeah, uh, yeah I, I, I do not know. I, yeah, I there, know. yeah, but these were mm -hmm. these 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 were large. Two of them, mm -hmm. a, a, a pair, uh, mm -hmm. uh, which were which were not gods themselves, right? Uh, at least at least now we're told they were not not the gods. They are representative of something else, right? Right. I do not know. I I, I don't um uh, I really don't know. There I, I think I think there's an answer. I think there's an answer yeah. somewhere, but I, honestly I don't know the answer. Yeah. And I'm 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 sorry, but that's it it's 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 left me exactly but the, but uh uh the, 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 there was one set in the northern kingdom mm -hmm. and there was a different set in Jerusalem. Okay. And there was that 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 distinction was very clear to people that the mm -hmm. northern kingdom uh, set things up differently mm -hmm. from the southern mm -hmm. kingdom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but mm -hmm. they were very special and significant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah. OK. Yeah. Not, but uh, but not bottom line is that when the Babylonians came in 587, they finished. They finished what they could have done in 597. Right. Uh, they finished it. And so all that stuff was taken away. And as far as we know, was not recovered. Uh, they, it was not something that was recovered later. Uh, and so and so when after the exile, when the temple is uh, rebuilt uh, and dedicated in, I believe, I believe it was dedicated in about 515, 515 BC or so, uh, about 20 to 25 years, about 25 years after the initial return. Um, it was considered, it was considered a new temple. It was, there was little continuity with the old one. Uh, and and thus begins in about 515 BC begins uh, what is known as the Second Temple period, uh, and I've described that as the period from 515 BC to about 70 AD. This is the the when whenever you hear scholars speak of the Second Temple period, that's the you know that's the almost 600 years or so that uh is being talked about 515 bc to about 70 a.d 70 a.d was when the romans came and destroyed that second temple uh king herod kind of in the time of you know right before right before the time of jesus king herod added 
a good bit to the temple complex uh, and made made the temple even you know even more glorious to behold than it was before it was pretty good before um uh, <clears throat> but uh but yeah all right let us in the time that we have left let us read uh chapter 28 it's a relatively short chapter um and this is this is uh the a brief story of Hananiah Hananiah someone who is one of those people who opposed Jeremiah he was a uh self-styled prophet uh one who you know presumably spoke the word of the Lord but the word of the Lord that he spoke was opposed to the word of the Lord that Jeremiah spoke. Um, and thus, uh, it doesn't ultimately bode well for Ananiah. So let's look at uh, chapter 28, verse 1. <clears throat> In that same year, so presumably 597 BC, at the beginning of the reign of King Zedekiah of Judah, in the fifth month of the fourth year, the prophet Hananiah, son of Azur from Gibeon, spoke to me in the house of the Lord, to me, Jeremiah, in the house of the Lord, in the presence of the priests and all the people, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. Within two years I will bring back to this place all the vessels of the Lord's house, which King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon took away from this place and carried to Babylon. I will also bring back to this place King Jeconiah, son of Jehoiakim of Judah, and all the exiles from Judah who went to Babylon, says the Lord, for I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. Then the prophet Jeremiah spoke to the prophet Hananiah in the presence of the priests and all the people who were standing in the house of the Lord. And the prophet Jeremiah said, Amen, may the Lord do so. May the Lord fulfill the words that you have prophesied and bring back to this place from Babylon the vessels of the house of the Lord and all the exiles. But listen now to this word that I speak in your hearing and the hearing of all the people. The prophets who preceded you and me from ancient times prophesied war, famine, and pestilence against many countries and great kingdoms. As for the prophet who prophesies peace, when the word of that prophet comes true, then it will be known that the Lord has truly sent the prophet. Then the prophet Hananiah took the yoke from the neck of the prophet Jeremiah <laughs> and broke it. So, you know, this is Jeremiah presumably making this message. He's got the yoke on. He's using the yoke as the object lesson about the yoke of the king of Babylon. <laughs> Hananiah takes the yoke, breaks it. I'm not quite sure how he did that, but, but broke it. And Hananiah spoke in the presence of all the people, saying, Thus says the Lord, This is how I will break the yoke of the king of the yoke of King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon from the neck of all the nations within two years. At this, the prophet Jeremiah went his way. Now let me just make a little comment before we read the rest. Hananiah is making a very specific <laughs> uh, prediction. A very specific prediction, which, you know, is verifiable. You know, it will it will play out to be true or false. Uh, it will be verified. In two, in two years. In, in, in two, two years. years. <laughs> this is all this going to end. So, you know, we'll know. We'll know who was right. Okay, so verse, verse 12. Sometime after the prophet Hananiah had broken the yoke from the neck of the prophet Jeremiah, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Go tell Hananiah, thus says the Lord, you have broken wooden bars only to forge iron bars in place of them. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I have put an iron yoke on the neck of all these nations so that they may serve King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, and they shall indeed serve him. I have even given him the wild animals." And the prophet Jeremiah said to the prophet Hananiah, listen, Hananiah, the Lord has not sent you, and you made this people trust in a lie. 
Therefore, thus says the Lord, I am going to send you off the face of the earth. Within this year, you will be dead because you have spoken rebellion against the Lord. In that same year, in the seventh month, the prophet Hananiah died. So, <laughs> Jeremiah's word came true. <laughs> Hananiah's did not. <laughs> but you, you, you skipped something. Uh, the yeah. end of verse 11... Uh huh. But Jeremiah the prophet went his way. That well, is, I, I, I read that, although I, but, we can yeah, comment yeah, on yeah. it. He didn't argue it before the priests. Right. He went away and later right. speaks of this yoke of iron. Right, right. Yeah, it's like, exactly, exactly. It's like in front of the people, he had the, the wooden yoke. Yes. And then Hananiah breaks it. Again, how he did that. I mean, apparently he took it off, maybe he smashed it or something, but... Uh, but yeah, it's it's later, it's later apparently out, out of the hearing of others that this word comes to Jeremiah and says, you know, okay, it, it's almost like God acknowledges, okay, maybe this wooden yoke wasn't the best object, you know, because you could break <laughs> the wooden yoke. By the way, just so there's no misunderstanding, it's really an iron yoke. It's an iron <laughs> yoke that, that's on the people that God has put. Or sometime later, he gets word that uh, that this man is ill and uh, may be dying. And uh, Jeremiah comes to the conclusion that it, it must be for some transgression against God. And uh, perfectly possible, it, it, perfectly possible. Uh, um, yeah, yeah, perfectly possible. Um, it's certainly presented. It's presented as, you know, something that happens well beforehand that Jeremiah says, Hananiah, you're wrong. Within a year, you'll be dead because you've spoken a lie. Um, you know, I but, mean, but, but, you know, exactly. You know, if, if, if it exactly happened that way, you know, we, yeah. we it's inaccessible to us. Um, but um, the bottom line is, I mean, the, ultimately the message is, is that Hananiah is a, is a name and a face, not a face, a name on the people alluded to in the previous chapter of people who were saying, you know, God doesn't really mean this. God, <laughs> this, this, uh, that it is not God's will that you be servants of the King of Babylon. Uh, and that within two years, you know, all of this will, all of this will be over. And while I'm sure I am sure that Jeremiah would have loved for Hananiah to be right. Uh, he knew he wasn't. He knew he wasn't. Is, is he being ironic then in, in verse six where he says, may it be so? Yeah, I think so. Lord... I, I think I think so. I mean, I think in the sense that Jeremiah, Jeremiah feels the pain of the words that he's bringing. Uh, you know, Jeremiah, I mean, no, 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 Jeremiah certainly we've seen has kind of a love hate thing going with his people. Um, but the, 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 the covenantal or the suffering that, that has been brought upon the people by their own disobedience, their own covenantal disobedience is a, is a source of enormous personal anguish for Jeremiah. It hurts him. It hurts him terribly that the people, and yet his people also frustrate him to no end. Um, it is perfectly possible. And I, and I, and I think we all know this for just from our own experience. It is perfectly possible to be, to feel and be hurt by the suffering of people you love and be enormously frustrated with them at the same time you know perfectly possible for that to happen and i think that's certainly what jeremiah is dealing with i mean we've certainly seen evident plenty of evidence of both his frustration his you know you idiot people you know and yet his broken heart his his tears uh 
which uh, which which ultimately earned him the the nickname the weeping prophet. Um, and so you know, and I but again, I think we know from our own experience how how you can you can be a vessel for both of those both of those things. Uh, but the, here here we have Uriah and. Uh, we, we we have these these other prophets who are speaking of what's gone wrong within Judah. Mm -hmm. uh, they, it doesn't end very well for either one, mm -hmm. particularly Uriah. Yet mm -hmm. Jeremiah survives. I remember the first when I first joined this group. I asked, "What was it about Jeremiah that he was the survivor?" Uh, uh, the worst that happened to him was he ended up in Egypt, but but right. he lived. He did, and 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 <laughs> in 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 these books he is he is the true prophet, mm -hmm. but it's only in these small details of when things would happen, or mm -hmm. how things would happen. But the overall thrust of 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 the of Judah having forsaken God. Mm -hmm. It's the same. Mm -hmm. It's the same message. Just just small differences of detail. Yeah, well, it's, uh, you know, it's, I mean, in terms of the, the difference between the true prophet and the, the true prophet and the, and the false prophet, yeah. in this case, is, a, is, is ultimately a, a, a radical difference in the meaning of the Babylonians being there the the babylonians coming you know the 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 false prophets were initially saying that god's going to stop the babylonians god's going to stop this from all happening um and then once it did start the false prophets were saying it's not going to last very long uh that this is that, that god is going to turn the tide and 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 god's gonna and in god we're going to celebrate celebrate freedom and 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 uh and all that and jeremiah you know jeremiah has the the unenviable and unpopular task of saying no this is actually happening number one this is actually meant to happen this is going to happen there's a theological spiritual purpose for it happening and at a certain point there's nothing there's really nothing that you can really do about it well Hen and i had the same message it was it's just a difference it, it between, did, it be, did. Be, be between two years and 60 years between who and who between between hananiah and jeremiah hananiah, hananiah was wrong <laughs> only only in terms of be, the difference between two years and 60 years no 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 Hananiah was wrong. He was simply wrong. And he was wrong in this, and he was wrong for a, a, a very dramatic reason. He was wrong because he didn't, re, he did not really believe that it was God's purpose that the people experienced this. That was the, that was the reason why, I mean, the two, he couldn't, right. that, he couldn't, he he pro almost certainly would have been among those people before before the Babylonians arrived. He would almost certainly have been among those people who who would say, "God won't let this happen. God God won't let this happen. God won't let the Babylonians get this close." Um, once it did happen, at least initially, you know, kind of kind of in its first phase, and that. Part of things was, you know, undeniable. I mean, there's there's no way you could walk that with that part back. Um, that once you walk that part back, that um, <laughs> you know there was at that point it was okay. The Babylonians are here, but it's not going to last long because God is not going to let is not going to let it drag out. And Jeremiah's and Jeremiah's point is. No, Hananiah, you have got this. You've got this way wrong. 
Um, this is this is this is purposeful. This is not accidental. This isn't just a blip. This is going. To, this is a meaningful thing that is going to mean the end of the pe the end of the nation as we have known it. This isn't going to be just an interruption. This is going to be the end of the people. Got it. End Got of our it. way of life as we know it. Yes, there's going to be there's going to be a remnant. There's going to be you know down the line eventually after after hitting rock bottom, there is going to be a kind of resurrection. Um, but it is going to be a <laughs> it's going to be a radical radical. Got it. Thing. Thank you. Yeah. 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 No. No. It's a, it's a fair. It, it's an absolutely fair. Fair question. I. I uh, but yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's see. So Hannah and, 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 and implicit of all that, if God yeah. isn't going to let it happen, it would be because we rebel. That that is you 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 resist. Whereas Jeremiah says, "Don't resist." Right. Right. Is that, yeah. And it's precisely because it's because Jeremiah recognizes in a way that Hananiah doesn't. Yes. That this is this is the judgment of God. This is this is happening because God has God has decided that this is that that this sickness in the people uh, is not something that the people are going to quickly and easily recover from. This is going to be, this is going to involve a kind of death. It's going to involve a kind of death. And down eventually in the grace of God and against all, you know, all reasonable forecasting, an act of God that will actually bring the people back, resurrect the people. And thus, and thus, the uh, the language of Ezekiel 37 uh, the Valley of Dry Bones, which assumes that the people, you know, who are who are you know languishing in exile, they see no hope, they see no future, uh, particularly for their community, for their not so much for their own individual physical lives, they seem to be surviving just fine, but as far as their community life, uh, their worship of Yahweh, their um, you know living out living out as a free people. That was those hopes were completely dashed, zero chance of it ever being reversed. And so the word of the Lord comes to Ezekiel, Valley of Dry Bones, and the announcement: No, God is going to is going to work a kind of resurrection. Um, but that's utterly unforeseeable from a that's utterly unforeseeable on a practical scale. Theologically, you know, with theological and spiritual imagination, you know, I think I think Jeremiah probably had some inkling of that. But I mean, the world, his world was falling apart. And so it wasn't something that he could easily just jump into. Um, OK, now next week, just give you a quick preview. Next week, we are going to get into. We're going to actually jump ahead uh, a little bit. Um, well, not well, not really. Uh, actually, it's it's a it is a letter. It is a letter that Jeremiah is going to send to the exiles, not the exiles of five eighty seven, but of five ninety seven. The exiles of five ninety seven, okay. and it is a it is a, a hopeful letter. Remember that Jeremiah is kind of favorable he's kind of favorable to these first this first round of exiles he's he's going to be real down on the second uh but he's he's kind of up on the first not because not because they're going to be coming home anytime soon um but because uh but because they from jeremiah's point of view they they may actually learn something uh sooner rather than later um this is also uh one of those um this is the source, chapter 29 is the source of the famous Jeremiah 29, 11. Uh, for, I, for surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for harm, to give you a future with hope. 
Uh, we will talk about the broader context of chapter 29 in light of the larger context of the book of Jeremiah. Uh, but I'll leave you with this thought as we as we start to sign off for today. Uh, I saw a wonderful Facebook meme going around uh, just over the weekend. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful pic uh, meme with <laughs> wonderful picture of uh, Carly Simon. You know Carly Simon. You know, uh, you know Carly Simon's most famous song. No, you're no. so vain. You're so vain. Oh. I mm -hmm. think this song is about you. Okay, okay. So okay, understanding that is essential to understanding what I'm about to say. So Carly Simon, you're so vain. And uh, so the meme, the meme said, uh, has a picture of Carly Simon. And she's doing this kind of goofy smile. And it says, you're so vain. You probably think Jeremiah 29, 11 is about you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. That's good. Nerdy. No, and it was about James Taylor. <laughs> right, right. It's but this is good nerdy theological biblical humor. So yeah, you probably think Jeremiah 29 11 is about you. So all right. Well, with that, we will uh we will sign off. Let's uh of course uh keep um Bill uh, Allworth in our prayers, yeah. Lois, of course. And uh, and continue to pray for um, for the many parts of the world that are uh, are troubled and under threat right now. All right, let's pray. Lord, we give you thanks for this day and this opportunity to gather as we do every week and to study this this great and grand book of Jeremiah that has challenged us on so many levels. Lord, we uh, we do. Pray for your continued guidance as we as we study these ancient words and see the resonances that these words have with uh, with our own times. Help us to creatively uh, see our own times in their light. Lord, we do lift up to you uh, all those uh, whom we have uh, held in our hearts now for 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 quite some time. Uh, do lift up to you, especially today, uh, Bill Allworth and Lois. Uh, pray for uh, for Sarah and for uh, for all those who have asked for our prayers, um, all those on our various on our own personal prayer lists and those uh, on our church's prayer lists. Uh, we pray for peace in the world, and especially wherever there is war, conflict, terror, fear, hunger. We pray for Gaza for Israel, for Sudan, and for Haiti, and for all other places, all other places that that long for, for peace and freedom and, uh, and for joy. We pray for your kingdom to come, for your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray all these things now in Jesus' name. Amen.